I study the history of an unthinkable thought. The rejection of slavery is perhaps the most basic tenet of our modern liberal political order. Whatever we think of one another, we seem at least to accept that no one of us ought ever to be a slave. But this was not always so. From classical antiquity, slavery was long considered like the family and the state, one of the common forms that human relations could legitimately take. The aim of my work is to recover the context of ideas in which slavery in America began. I focus on English culture during the early modern period, roughly from 1550 to 1700. During this time, the English trade in African slaves got underway, and as it accelerated, helped to establish slave systems in colonies from Jamaica and Barbados to Carolina and Virginia. What most strikes the modern observer of these events is the ease with which the English accepted the rise of slavery. Very few writers bothered to defend it as right from an ethical point of view, and even fewer spoke up to say that it was wrong. And so to be more precise, I study the history of a thought that is, to us, unthinkable. In a setting in which it was so much a matter of course as hardly to require sustained thought. In early modern English texts, ideas of slavery were inherited above all from Rome. The Roman law had started from the premise that by nature, all persons were free. But it had allowed that some persons might be made slaves as a substitute for death when they were convicted of certain crimes or taken captive in war. English authors insisted as, as well upon the natural freedom of all mankind. But like their Roman sources, they believed that there was no fate worse than death. And so they saw it almost as a form of mercy to enslave persons whom one might otherwise have killed. Here was a mental world in which to explain why certain persons were slaves was not to make any statement about what by nature or in essence they were. It was instead to give an account of what they had done or more often of what had been done to them. In part because they understood slavery in this way, through the early decades of their transatlantic slave trade, the English felt little need to insist that the Africans were inferior. Consider, for example, the maps of Africa, current in England at the time. These were beautifully colored and intricately detailed. They divided the continent into more than a dozen regions. Inset figures showed the variety of the peoples in complexion, manners, dress, and religion. The centers of African life were the cities, kingdoms, and empires that filled the coasts and spread throughout the interior. By the 19th century, English maps of Africa had changed dramatically. Vast stretches of land were now marked simply unknown parts. But long before the English had learned to represent Africa as the dark continent, they had known it as a part of the world not so dissimilar from their own. And in particular, there was one feature of African life that the English found familiar. The peoples they met in kingdoms along the western coast held slaves, who had, for the most part, been condemned by their rulers as punishment for crimes or taken captive in wars between states. English observers recognized these as the same sources of slavery defined in the Roman legal tradition. What they seemed not to have perceived was that slaves in Africa were drawn in to the societies they served in the manner of servants or tenants in England. And in part because they missed this fact, the English, astonishingly, 
we're able to overlook as well the vast difference between slavery in Africa and the brutal regimes of slave labor that they were just then creating in the New World. The Africans knew full well that their fate was about to change. They were said to fear that the English would eat them on the other side of the Atlantic. And in a sense, they were right. During years of research into this one unthinkable thought, I've come to reflect on unthinkable thoughts in general. As it happens, the past is full of them. And we must assume that from the point of view of the future, so is the present. When scholars years from now look back on us, what will they find to have been our most terrible crime? Will it be that we ate animals for food? That we slowly destroyed the only planet that we have? Or that we were so unequal? Precisely the point is that we cannot know the answer to this question. The subjects of my work, they're not alien to me. And that is the worst of it. But as I would myself be understood, so I have tried to understand them.